All right. Well, good morning, Fred Log, and uh, welcome to our first ever virtual session, courtesy of COVID-19. Uh, my name is Ted Burnell, and with me today is Peter Larson. We're going to be talking to you guys about getting started with Linux. This is really like a Linux 101 presentation. So if you've used Linux for any amount of time, um, most of this is going to be very well-known things to you, but you may still get a couple little nuggets of information out of it. If you're new to Linux, this is kind of where you want to start. It's going to be some basic commands, basic layout of the GUI. We're not going to go in depth with anything such as how file systems are created or advanced commands. Uh, we're just going to get going with the basics. So without further ado, let's get started. Oh, and if you, if you want to ask a question, Peter's monitoring the, the Blue Jeans chat room. You can ask him there or just feel free to interrupt. Either way works. And, um, you know, we, we we're hoping that this works out well for us today. All right, so a little history behind Linux. Um, the, the project started about 40 years, well, it didn't start 40 years ago. 40 years ago, computers were absolutely huge. And if you look on the right-hand side of the screen, you have a couple screenshots of what those early computers looked like. There was no compatibility between the systems and the cost per unit of computing was super expensive. Um, I watched a movie the other day called Hidden Numbers, I think. I think that was the name of it. And it talked about the, the women who worked at NASA who were, Hidden they had things. the title, the job title of computer. Hidden and figures. their job was to do a lot of the math calculations that NASA needed to get somebody into space. And during that movie, they brought in the IBM. Um, that's what they kept referring to it to as, but it was an IBM mainframe that took up an entire room in the NASA building. And they actually had to remodel the, they had to take out a door because the, the computer was so big, it couldn't even fit through the door. They had to take out a door and put in a double door just to get the computer into the building. So, you know, watching that just kind of brought uh, that bit of history back to me. In 1969, Bell Labs, to address some of these concerns about the computers being huge and expensive and in incompatible with each other, they created Unix. They want to address some of these concerns, especially around compatibility. They wanted Unix to be simple. It was written in C, and you could reuse code in other spots of the in the operating system. So phenomenal idea, right? Everybody everybody liked it, but Unix had this reputation of being hard, especially when things like um, you, um, um, Mac and and Windows came out. And so to bring us into more current state, 1991, University of Helsinki, Linus Torvalds decides he's going to start a, a, a software project of his own. And he wanted it to be compatible with Unix, which is called POSIX, when, you're, when you have that, that compatibility. That's, that's their, their layer that they do all the compatibility work in. And I actually have a picture of Linus down the bottom right-hand corner of the screen. Looks like he's enjoying a beverage. And next to that is a letter. Betty wrote an email where he wrote, Hi, everybody out there using Minix. I'm doing a free operating system, just a hobby. Won't be big and professional like GNU for 386 and 486 AT clones. Those were little PCs. This has been brewing since April and is starting to get ready. I'd like feedback on things people like or dislike in Minix as my OS resembles it. Somewhat the same, somewhat uh, resembles it somewhat. Same physical layout of the file system due to practical reasons, among other things. And, um, you know, what's really interesting here is that he was like, hey, it's not going to be anything big. This is just a hobby. And when you look at Linux now, it has absolutely exploded. Uh, several companies that use Linux, and some of these might be a surprise to people, but Cisco uses Linux. Wikipedia hosts their entire website on Linux. Netflix streams all the videos from Linux. Amazon uh, completely running Linux. Microsoft, if anybody's ever used Microsoft Azure, you've used Microsoft's version of Linux. The US Postal Service, Tesla, NASA, SpaceX, McDonald's, of course, IBM, and the Department of Defense. Linux is going where no man has gone before. It's actually helping NASA's Curiosity rover explore Mars and take pictures and send them back to Earth. Um, and, and as far as I know, that, that mission should have been over already, but curiosity continues to roll on. <clears throat> Linux is also transforming transportation. So the entire US air traffic control sector has been rebuilt to run on top of Linux. 
Queensland Motorway, Motorways relies on Linux to do smart traffic management and keep traffic moving in the most efficient way possible. And the bullet trains in Japan, if anybody's ever seen those, those are pretty awesome to watch. Um, they all run on Linux for scheduling trains, make sure two trains aren't going the opposite direction on the same track. We actually use Linux for the same reason here in the US uh, to schedule trains and their uses of, of tracks. Um, because we don't we don't want two trains barreling towards each other in opposite directions. So Linux is everywhere. If you think about it, it's on your watch, it's on your cell phone probably, it's on your laptops, it's in the ordering systems at the restaurants. It's kind of everywhere now. Most websites that are out there are running Linux. So it's really grown. So today, you know, we're talking about how do I get started? And of course, step number one of getting started with Linux is to pick a distro. Um, but then the question is, what is a distro? A Linux distribution or distro is an operating system made up of software collections that, is, that are based on a Linux kernel and often a package management system. That's how Wikipedia describes a Linux distro. And there's a lot of Linux distros out there. Um, the website over on the right-hand side of the screen, that's DistroWatch. They try to keep track of every Linux distro that is out there. And some of the ones that you can see on their screen, if you can, if you can, if your screen is is able to, to make it legible, you got React OS, you got AV Linux. AV Linux is is you know built around a bunch of utilities that help with audio visual um, kind of features. Tails, um, and the list just goes on and on. But some of the most popular ones and the ones that um, we see people using the most are Ubuntu, Fedora, Mint, which is a a spinoff of Ubuntu. CentOS, which is a spin-off of Red Hat Enterprise Linux, where uh, Peter and I work at Red Hat. Um, Arch and Deepin. Deepin is a new distro. Um, a lot of people like it. They say it's absolutely beautiful. Um, I've looked at it, earlier versions of it. It was, it's a very elegant looking um, Linux desktop environment. But if you ever want to explore how many distros are actually out there, I invite you to the DistroWatch website. There's a lot of information on there, how many times people have downloaded dis different distros. I don't know how much I trust that, um, but it's kind of cool if you just want to experiment with different types of Linux and see the different types of applications that they bundle into the distro. So what is included in a distro? What's this collection of software um, that we hear about? Well, there's some very common parts of every distro. And the first one is the installer. The installer is what's used to actually install the operating system on your laptop. Um, what's become more and more popular in the in recent years is this idea of a live USB image where instead of downloading an ISO and then going through a regular installer, we now uh, just create the ISO so it runs automatically and it allows you to try out the distro, make sure everything's going to work, make sure the hardware is compatible with it. And then if you like it, you select install the hard drive and the operating system installs. We're gonna see that here um, in a little bit as part of the demo. The next thing that you see is bootloader. This is how it boots the Linux operating system, manages the boot process for the system. Not too terribly exciting piece of, of software, but it is something that you'll have to interact with from time to time. Uh, next part, the Linux kernel. This is the actual Linux part of the operating system. None of the other parts of the operating system are actually called Linux just the Linux kernel is. And this thing, it runs in the background. You never you never see it, you never hear from it unless it's crashing and doing a core dump. Um, but this is like the traffic cop of the operating system. It manages access to hardware, manages access to your, to your different file systems, and it runs all the different processes that are needed to um, interact with the operating system. The next part is core utilities. These are tools, application services that are bundled along with the kernel to make the operating system functional. Um, the kernel itself doesn't do a whole lot, so it needs some, some programs on the outside to help things work. We saw some from Linus's post where he said that, you know, his, his is based mainly on Minix. You know, the file system layout is very much the same. So some of those core utilities are gonna be the utilities that interact with the file system that allow you to mount hard drives and things like that. We're gonna get into a little discussion of mounting um, different disks and stuff like that here shortly. But there's a lot of different core utilities um, that are included with the operating system um, so that you can control what you're doing. 
The next part is the shell, also known as the command line interface. This tends to be the most daunting, most intimidating part of the operating system. It's the textual interface for interacting with the operating system. So a lot of people nowadays are used to having GUIs, and yes, Linux absolutely does have a GUI. Um, but to get the real power out of Linux, you got to go to the command line. Um, and we've seen other operating systems recently kind of follow suit where they've created really strong shell environments um, just because it's easier. You feel like you have more control. You're closer to that actual Linux uh, kernel part of the operating system. You don't have some graphical interface limiting what you can and can't do. So shell is very important. Package management manages how software is installed and updated on the system. If you can't install up software easily, you can't update it easily, um, then operating systems become frustrating and nobody wants to use them. Documentation, manuals for how different software components should work, how they how you can interact with them. Um, all those are included in a Linux distro. Uh, daemons, certain services and programs that run the background as part of the operating system without user intervention, but they're there so we can interact with them. So if you come to Fredlog meetings in the past, you saw us talk about things like virtual machines and containers and the cockpit web interface and um, AIML. You've seen us talk about a lot of things. A lot of those run as daemons in the background and we can interface with them, but we don't have to control whether they're actually running or not. Then we have Windows managers, which if you have a Linux system booted up right now, you are inside of a, you're, you're, you are running a window manager. <clears throat> window managers just control the placement and display of application windows. And then lastly is the desktop environment. This is going to be something like um, the GNOME um, environment or KDE or Deepin or um, Unity if you're an Ubuntu user um, before they got rid of it. Um, so there's a lot of different desktop environments out there. It's all about having choice. And uh, that choice is really um, what makes Linux and a uh, uh, um, attractive operating system for a lot of people. Could you um, could you maybe talk a little bit about? I think sometimes people get confused between the window manager and the and the desktop environment. I mean, you know, it seems like the the difference between those two is kind of blurred over time. Yeah, absolutely. So the window window manager that's going to be something like X, um, or it's going to be Wayland, and what they do is they actually control how windows are placed on the screen within the operating system okay so they're they're responsible for displaying windows they're responsible for the placement of windows the desktop environment it's a bunch of bundled applications right so you got things like uh, gui tools for doing disk management you got um, firefox or chrome as a web browser and then they also can decorate the windows that are placed on the screen and make the operating the desktop environment look very unique so one controls things, the other one runs things. So I would say that's probably the biggest difference is that control versus run kind of mentality. Does that make sense? It was just, um, I was just thinking about way back in the early days, you know, when we would call things like uh, not X windows, you would, you would often call things like TWN a window manager, you know, mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, you know, they, but they don't, they're not the bottom layer, you know, which is, well, in this case, basically X windows or some version of X windows or Wayland. But, you know, I was just thinking about that term window manager and how like TWM is, was it, what it stands for? God, what does it stand for? Is it something window manager? I can't remember what it's, what this, what the acronym stands yeah, there for. Was, but, there was one yeah. that was trying really hard to look like Microsoft windows. I think that yeah. was TWM, right? Yeah, it's TWM. And then, you know, there's been, you know, the, the very early ones were called enlightenment. You know, mm -hmm. uh, you know, so, you know, but I was just thinking about that. Mm, yeah, you know, someone might get a little bit confused talking about the difference yeah. between Windows managers and yeah, desktop I think, environments. I, had, I think the whole nomenclature of desktop environment has really come on um, a lot as of late. You know, I don't think it's something that probably existed 25 years ago because we just had the Windows, man, the window managers like Enlightenment that did a great job of decorating the desktop, making it look really, really fancy and, you know, decorating the windows. Um, the application windows that were being placed. Um, so Enlightenment was probably an early version of the desktop environment because it was interacting with X, which was Window Manager. Um, but at the time, we didn't really differentiate between Window Manager and Desktop Environment. So I think Desktop Environment is kind of a newer term. 
I went very way. hard to use too. Enlightenment in the very beginning. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't fun. But that <laughs> Windows you. one, the, the one that looks like Windows, was just kind of hokey too. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I bounced back and forth between a couple of those. I, I start using GNOME back in the 1.0 version of GNOME, so or pre one. All right. So moving on, uh, ways to install Linux. So there's three main ways. We have a DVD or ISO image, <clears throat> which if we have time at the end of this today, we'll show you what a DVD install looks like. Peter has one of those uh, queued up on his laptop. USB flash drive, which again, this is um, one of the more popular ways of installing right now. Uh, you, you go to the website, you download an image, you can use any number of tools to copy the ISO image to a flash drive. You can use the DD command, which unfortunately we're not covering today. Um, or you can use a number of GUI tools that they have out there for Windows and Mac and Linux to allow you to copy the ISO image over to a flash drive, mark it bootable, and do all these other things behind the scenes. So that when you plug your flash drive into a computer, it works. And again, it's, it's not booting off the hard drive. So if you have a, a Windows operating system or you have you know, some other version of Linux, or maybe it's Mac OS, and you don't want to blow it away, you don't want to get rid of it because you have a lot of data there that you don't want to lose, this will gives you an alternative way of trying Linux and, and seeing if all the hardware works, making sure it detects all your devices, and then we can discuss how to install it. So either sit side by side with the operating system or how to back up the data that you need off your old OS and replace it. The third way of installing is doing a network or cloud image install. So network installs, that includes things like Pixie Boot, uh, Boot P installs, uh, where you, you, you um, basically are using DHCP to tell you, hey, this server over here has an image. That image gets downloaded over the network, and it's just enough to get Linux started, and it'll start up the installer and, and download additional packages over the network to install the operating system in whatever way you want. Uh, cloud images, these are pre-configured images. Um, if, you're, if you've ever used VMware, it's a VMDK. Um, if you use um, Linux, it's a QCOW. If you use um, Amazon, it's an AMI. But these are images that are basically just virtual hard disk um, images. So you can load those up in a, in a hypervisor of some sort, start it, and you have a flow-blown operating system ready to go. Uh, the problem there is that somebody's already customized it for you, and you, you may have to go through and do a lot of extra steps to either remove the things that they liked and that they put into the image, and then put the stuff in that you like, or you know just customizing it to your own liking. So there may be some extra work there uh, that you don't really have to do with the other uh, ways that we do installs. <clears throat> that brings us to let's install a distro. Um, so obviously being a Red Hat employee, I'm going to default towards Fedora um, as the operating system I use for um, things like Fredlog and stuff like that. And I've already actually installed an operating system today. So this is Fedora 30. It is a version old. Um, the current version is Fedora 31. And the version that's going to be coming out in the next week or two, I believe, is Fedora 32. And um, so I've logged into the system. It doesn't have a user account protecting it or anything. But um, I, I'm running this right now off of a live USB image within a virtual machine. So when I click on Activities, I can see I have this icon here. When I hover over it, it says Install to Hard Drive. So I've checked everything. I know that this virtual machine is working properly. It's interfacing with all the hardware the way it should be. And now I want to install it to the hard drive. So I'm going to click this. And what you'll see is, well, my laptop will probably get really noisy. Um, but what it should do in a couple seconds here is it should start up an installation program. And let me do some configuration to get things installed on hard drive. So here we go. Welcome to Fedora 30. I get to pick what language I want to do everything in. Um, English is the only language I'm, I actually speak, although I am taking classes and speaking German. And so click Continue. Um, installation destination, you can see this, this is, is, is in red. It's just giving me a warning that 
you know, it's already selected a, a destination and it's doing automatic partitioning. I can click on that and kind of check things out. It's going to install to a 25 gig hard drive. Uh, storage configuration is going to be automatic. I like to keep things simple because I'm new to Linux. So I'm just going to click done. Now, different, different versions of Linux have different installers too. So this may not look exactly like the installer in the version of Linux that you're running. And that's okay uh, because at the end of the install, what we get is the same result. We get we end up with Linux running on our local hard drive. So if I click next, you can see it uh, creating a bunch of file systems on my um, on my local hard drive. And what we're going to do while this is installing is we're going to oh, there we go software install. Sorry, one percent done. Um, so while this is doing this thing, we're going to go back to our slide deck, and we're going to talk a little bit about um what the different distros kind of kind of provide so when you go to fedora's website which is fedoraproject.org um this is what the website looks like and a lot of distros do the same thing so ubuntu does the same thing too you go to the website and you can see that there's different options you can download a server variant you can download a workstation variant i'm actually using the workstation variant today but then with fedora we have a couple other variants available too which we call the Emerging Fedora Editions. And this is where we're trying things out. We're, 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 it's gonna, it, it'll fluctuate a lot between versions. Um, it is, it's gonna be kind of stable. Most of the time, it'll be mostly stable, um, but you may occasionally run into problems. So we have Fedora Core OS, Fedora Silver Blue, and Fedora IoT. So if you're doing any kind of IoT kind of work, Internet of Things, where small computers sitting out on the edge, monitoring devices, Doing, doing minimal processing maybe, and then forwarding information on another system, um, that might be something to look at. Fedora Silver Blue and Core OS, do you want to cover those really, Peter? Uh, really quick, Peter? I'm going to run and get a glass of water. Oh, okay. Uh, sure. Sorry. <laughs> um, so, actually, I, what I would actually say, so Fedora is... What they have realized is a lot of use cases come down to, I want to get started, but I don't know all the software that's available. So we make prepackaged installations that basically says, if you're interested in this particular topic, uh, here's what we call a spin. And that may be, let's say it's about graphic design. So not just does it install a graphical interface, but it installs all the graphical tools that comes with Fedora. Uh, same for music, same for editing and all that. So below what you see here was actually be a huge long list of specialization. But what you see here is a uh, different aspect. So CoreOS, I'm, I'm fairly sure if you guys are at the point where you're starting out, it's probably not what you're going to be touching right now. That said, what CoreOS does is, is a very minimal... Uh, OS that is not based on RPM. So we haven't touched on pack package managers yet. It's actually based on something called OS tree. So the operating system itself behaves like a container, uh, which means that you can install a package onto it. You literally have to run a container on top of it. That's what it's meant to do. Uh, it is what's behind everything that runs Kubernetes and everything else out there. It's extremely small and very agile, but it is Linux. And that's pretty much what we got to can deal with. Um, Silver Blue is sort of like the next step up. It's still meant to run containers, but it gives you some cool user tools and all that. There is no user tools in CoreOS other than here's how to run a container. So, if you are into the container world, those are the kind of distributions that you want to take a look at. IoT is, again, Linux. It is compiled for usually a uh, ARM type architecture. You do have a couple of choices there. And it provides, or they're trying to basically provide an extremely small install base that can go on devices that may only have you know, less than a, a gigabyte of, uh, of SD card and everything else, and everything has to be self-contained. Think 
like a router or a switch that needs to just boot a very small OS. So if once you get through all of this, and you actually if you if you scroll down, go to this page called getfedora.org, scroll down, and you will see a ton more options than what you see here. Uh, hey, I want to get started, but I'm very interested, let's say music, there's a spin for that. If you're interested in graphical design, there's a spin for that, et cetera. And it just basically installs everything out of the box for you, instead of you having to figure out what the software is called. That's it. See you back. All right, thanks, Peter. I was about to start coughing. That's why I had to run and get a glass of water. But I appreciate that. So pretty soon our operating system is going to be done installing. And when it does, we're going to go ahead and explore the GUI a little bit. On the screen, I have four different GUIs. And um, so the top left one is KDE, the K desktop environment. The bottom one on the left, that is the Deepin desktop, uh, fairly new distribution. So again, supposed to be very elegant looking. The one in the top right is the Mint desktop. I believe it's called Mate. And then the one in the bottom right is GNOME, which is what we're going to be looking at today. What's really interesting is although these are four different distributions on the screen, each one of them has several core components or common components that they all share. They all have a panel. We're going to, we're going to explain where all these things are here in a little bit. They all have a menu. They all have a system tray. They all use icons. They all have launchers to launch different applications. They all have dashboards where you can see uh, running process or icons that you can click on to quickly launch things that are already out there running. They'll have a file manager. They'll have a terminal terminal emulator. <coughs> they have several different text editors <coughs> and then configuration tools. Uh, for things like configuring networking and, and stuff like that. So let's take a quick look and see where our virtual machine is. It is almost done. It's 100% done installing software. So we're going to get into the boot install phase here pretty soon, where it creates the initial RAM disk and configures the kernel. Um, so you know, looking at the, I'll start explaining some of the stuff. If you look at, up here at the K desktop environment, they have something inside of KDE that I thought was really cool for a long time. And it's this concept of widgets. And so this clock that you see on the, that looks like it's part of the wallpaper, it's actually a, a GUI clock. And so with KDE, you can put widgets like that on your desktop. Um, it is possible to do that with other desktop environments as well. Um, but KDE really kind of showcases it more than the other ones do. Um, you can see that they all kind of use different icon themes. KDE's icons tend to be very vibrant and colorful. Uh, Deepin tries to make things also vibrant and colorful, but maybe not quite as much as KDE does. But a lot of use of trans, translucent panels and stuff like that that you can see through and, you know, kind of blurs the picture a little bit behind it. Uh, Mint, you know, common kind of um, look and feel to it with that green theme that they have. Um, and then down here with GNOME, this is their, um, I forgot what they call this, this view, but it's something you can get into by going to the upper right or upper left-hand corner. Activities. Of the screen. Activities, there we go. Yeah, so you go to the upper left-hand corner of the screen and it gives you this kind of view of all the different windows you have open so you can easily uh, scroll through and pick which window that you want to, that you want to interact with. So let's check again on our install. It's installing the bootloader, forming post installation setup tasks. Should just about be done. So it doesn't take a long time to install Linux. My work laptop is a little bit slower than my personal laptop, but my uh, personal laptop didn't want to share the screen very nicely this morning. So I was scrambling there at the end to get this, this going. Um, so while we're sitting here, I do want to give everybody an update. The library is still sponsoring our group, even though we've moved into kind of a virtual presentation mode. Uh, so I want to just say thanks to the Central Rappahannock Regional Library for continuing to support our group and um, you know put word out about our meetings and stuff. So if we have to do this again next month, uh, where it's going to be another virtual meeting, perhaps um, we'll be able to have some some additional. <clears throat> advertising stuff from them on their Facebook page and 
and such. <clears throat> so now it's generating the initial RAM file system, initial RAM disk, and this should only take a couple of minutes and then it should be done. And like I said, different different distributions have different installers. Um, and you know, like if, if you're using Linux Mint and you're installing somewhere, and it'll it'll tell you if it detects, you know, something like Microsoft Windows, and it'll try to configure itself to sit side by side with Microsoft Windows. So uh, the installers have really gotten advanced. They can take advantage of all the new uh, security systems and, and whatnot that the manufacturers are um, integrating with their motherboards. So our installer's done, I can click quit. It gets me out of the installation program, and now I'm at my desktop environment. So we talked about things like system tray. This is my system tray up here in the upper right-hand corner. You can see I have a network icon to tell me I'm connected to a network. Um, you can see where my user account is still called <coughs> live system user. That's this default user, but I can log out, I can do some account settings here uh, to change the some specifics about the user, including maybe changing the avatar that's associated with them. Um, other things I can do up here, yep, there he is. So I can change this, like if I don't want to be known as live system user anymore, I can change it to my name. I didn't unlock it, so no, let me change it, good. All right, so um, other spots where we can do configuration. Obviously, the, the gear icon has become almost universal for meaning configuration. So if we click on that, we can see that there's a ton of different configuration options that we can explore. Um, the back arrow up here always goes back. So Bluetooth, notifications, background images, um, universal access. You know, so we can do things like high contrast. Um, we can show universal access menu up in our system tray. So now we got this icon coming down. And we can choose which features we want and don't want. Um, we can look at online accounts. So do I want to integrate with any of these online services, including Microsoft Exchange, boo, hiss. Um, I can look at different privacy. You know, do I want to use the screen lock? Do I want to use location services so that my laptop's constantly advertising where I'm at? Maybe not. Might keep all that stuff off, maintain your privacy. I can look at default applications, but what I really want to get to is network. So in here, if I if I had Wi-Fi, and I, I don't because I'm using a virtual machine, in here I would be able to see all the different Wi-Fi networks um, that I can access. In fact, I'll just show it over here on my real desktop. Can you guys see that? Is that coming through? Yes, sir. Okay. It'll come down to uh, network on here and it'll unplug Bluetooth. You can network devices. Doesn't show me my Wi Fi stuff. Okay, so to configure Wi Fi, you can just come select network. And here's where you select your network. You can also go to Wi-Fi settings. And here it's showing me all my available networks in my house. So I have my Fios router, my um, my uh, whole home network. A sound bar, which is kind of funny. I have a, have a sound bar that has Wi-Fi access point on it. Um, so, and so I can connect to those. I can go in airplane mode, which is really popular on cell phones, but we have that in Linux too now. Or I can just turn off Wi-Fi altogether. I'm not going to do that because that would cause me to disconnect from the session and things go away. Um, but going back to our VM, we can see inside of here that I have a wired connection. I can set up VPNs. Obviously, being Red Hat, I had a lot of VPNs set up on my previous screen. I don't know if you guys caught that or not. Um, but if I need to change my network settings, I just click on the gear. Gear always means settings. And now I can go through and I can change my the name of my network connection. Now I can look at my net, my MAC address. I can set up uh, IPv4 settings. Right now it's all set to DHCP. But if I want to enter a manual address, I just click manual, enter the address, NetMask gateway, change the DNS if I need to. Uh, but we're going to leave that set to automatic. So there's a ton of different configuration screens like that uh, throughout Linux. It's one of the features that's common across all the different distributions. They may have slightly different ways of showing the configuration panels, but the, the thing is, is that 
um, every desktop has the way to do some configuration of the operating system right from the desktop. Uh, next thing that we need to look at is the system tray. Up here in, in Fedora 30, the system tray is right up here. I can get notifications for any of those online services I'm subscribed to, which are none of them right now. I can also see a calendar. Um, I can set a location and get the current weather if I don't want to look outside or open a window to see what the weather's like. I can add different world clocks so I can see what time it is around different parts of the world. And so this is my, my tray, my notification area as well. And over here is activities. And we saw it earlier, you may have caught, caught it when I clicked install the hard drive icon. It's still there. Um, if I reboot, I think it goes away. Um, but it has a file manager. So if I click on it, it's just kind of the same looking file manager that you see in any operating system. So I have different areas around here. This is my USB thumb drive that booted off of this 1.8 gig volume. Um, so I have different folders for different types of um, files that I might generate while I'm using my operating system. And those are just created by default just to kind of be nice and do something for us. Um, I also have a whole bunch of applications that I can play with. So if I click down here with all the dots are, I get my applications that show up, and there's a bunch of stuff in here. We have uh, characters, we have a document viewer, disk usage, more disk utilities, um, installed hard drive, we have a map program. Right? We can scroll through these just by using the mouse scrolling up and down, or you can click on these buttons over on the side. You can scroll up and down and see all the different programs. Um, sometimes, you know, if, if you're one of these users who just uses a lot of different software, um, this can become a very crowded screen, and you'll have several dots over here to scroll up and down. So you can change this frequent view too, and that'll just show the, the applications that you're using most frequently. So kind of cool. Again, this is the way GNOME is set up. Different desktop environments might be a little bit different. Um, but pick your distro, try several of them, use different USB drives, and figure out how you want it to work. Um, inside GNOME, if I want to add an application like Maps over here to my, this is called Dash, this bar over here. This is where a bunch of launchers are, launchers launch applications. If I wanted to add the Maps program to here, I just right click, add favorites, it shows up in my dash. If I want to launch that application, I just click it, the application launches, in a couple seconds you'll see the map program start up. So there's the maps. And it, it is somehow using my location and saying I'm over here in DC somewhere, um, which I'm not, I'm in Virginia. So um, that's our kind, of, kind of our little tour of the desktop. One of the other features is that it has a terminal. Now, if you notice, my dash doesn't have a terminal program in it yet. One of the cool features here is I can search for a terminal. I can type in terminal, or this is kind of cool if you're coming from Windows environment, you're used to typing CMD to get a terminal. You can type CMD here, and guess what? You get a terminal. So uh, they have that one alias pretty good, pretty well. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to go back to our slide deck. And we've discussed the different components. We navigate it through our GUI. Now we're going to get into shell navigation. Uh, GUIs, they, they're kind of cool because they put some guardrails around what you can and can't do when you're first getting into an operating system. And so it's a pretty safe environment to be in. Um, with the shell, things can go really bad really quickly. Um, but it is something that people who are new to Unix should, or new to Linux, should get used to using. So what we're going to do is we're going to spend some time now, a lot of time, uh, going through the shell, and we're going to learn a bunch of different commands. Uh, these are commands that are generally agreed upon that new um, Linux users should know. And um, so as I'm going through here, you guys can follow along in your own Linux uh, systems if you want, um, and and we'll just we'll get, we'll try to get through these slides. They're they're not going to be terribly exciting, but like I said, it is something that's really good to know. So um, before I get going in that though, I think it'd be easier if I just okay terminal. So I'm going to get my IP address 
122.88. And I'm just going to open up a terminal window on my own system that we can use so that I can demonstrate the commands to everybody. Is this text too hard for anybody to read? Works for me. It works. Right. You may want to reboot it, uh, Ted, so you get a real system instead of your IBM. Yeah, okay. I'll reboot it. So as Gnome shuts down, or as Fedora shuts down, it, it kind of scrolls through and shows you everything that's doing the shutdown. And hold on one sec. Force off is like pulling a power plug. I need to tell it not to boot off the CD anymore. So guys, ignore this part. This isn't part of the presentation. They want to tell them what you're doing though, since they may not yeah. know. So what I'm doing is I'm just rebooting the system. If, if I had a USB drive, um, I would have taken the USB drive out of the system. I still had that plugged in, um, configured to boot every time off that USB, uh, the, the virtual USB drive. So I was disconnecting it from the system, going through the little hypervisor program that we have built into um, into RHEL. So the, the desktop environment that I'm using, um, if you notice, it's got the little Red Hat icon in the upper left-hand corner of my actual desktop. This is Red Hat Enterprise Linux 8. Um, but the regular laptop I use for Fred Lug meetings runs Fedora. So um, the welcome screen. So we booted back into the um, into Fedora 30, and now we get this welcome screen. So um, on the welcome screen, this this usually pops up in different operating systems, different distros, um, different ways. But I don't want to use any privacy stuff. I don't want to report any errors, even though that would help our developers. Um, I don't want to set up any online accounts. And I'm going to tell a little bit about myself. My name is Ted, and my password is not very strong. Boom, so I can start using Fedora. Next thing is it wants to show me a bunch of videos about how to use Fedora. Um, we're just going to skip those. Instead, I'm going to go to our presentation and my terminal window. Yeah, probably won't work because you got a new new IP address. But you also have a user now that you didn't have before. Yeah. That should have worked though. That's not what I wanted. One thing with running inside of virtual machines is there's a little bit of a performance hit. Yeah, I got the right IP address. So you we'll just workstation do... and you need to enable a SSHD. Do the sudo SSHDL start SSHD. That will not be started by default. All right, so again, not part of the presentation, what I'm doing is I'm starting SSHD. All right, so cool. Now you can see that I am logged into my live Fedora image because um, we're not going to use a GUI anymore, so we'll get rid of that. So um, some of the commands that we can use for shell navigation. If I want to navigate through the shell, um, there's several commands that come in very handy. And the first one of those is the one called less. And there's, there's one that some people will, will also use a lot called more. Um, less is better than more because it allows you to go up and down in the file. More only allows you to go down. So um, there's always that little joke there about less being better, the, better than more. So I don't seem to have anything on my 
system that I can actually use. That's not surprising. Um, so what I'll do is I'm going to use this this bash logout command. It has a dot in front of it, which means it's a hidden file. We're going to talk about that more in the future. But if I wanted to, that's not going to be a very long file. Um, all right, back to the GUI for a second, guys. I need to download a longer file. I really want to do that. You have yeah. a bunch in user chat doc. Yeah, that's true. All right, so let's go less user share. And you guys will understand this. Um, damn, a lot. Um, let's do GNOME Desktop 3. So when I'm using less, I can scroll up and down. Get rid of that. I can scroll up and down in this file and read it, right? So really handy if I want to read some documentation. If I'm at the top and I'm like, you know, I know there's some examples at the bottom of this file, I can shift, hit shift G, takes me right to the end of the file. And you know you're at the end of the file when the word end appears at the bottom of the screen. So very handy tool. Less. So I'm going to hit Q to leave that. The next thing we're going to look at is the command file. File will help you determine um, what type of file you're looking at. So we know that this README file is a text document. If I type in file, it's going to tell me that README file that we were just looking at. It's ASCII text. Now if I do something, I say file desktop right desktop is a directory so uh, file comes in very handy for showing me uh, what type of file it is sometimes if you're just doing an ls command you know now with the the shell the way i have my shell set up is directory is always highlighted in blue but if i didn't if i was in a shell environment that didn't do any highlighting like that it might be kind of hard to tell hey is that a directory or a folder and so i could use a file command tell me what kind of file it is Another thing that's kind of handy to look at is the command tree. This shows a directory tree the same way you would see a directory tree if you're looking at a file explorer. Um, I can make another directory, which we're going to get into make dir later on. I'm going to call this documents, and we'll call these private documents. And if I rerun tree command, I can now see that I have a directory underneath documents called private. So tree very very handy for looking at the directory tree structure when you're in the command line environment a lot of people they like the GUI based browsers or the GUI based file explorers because it shows them the directory tree it shows them that hierarchy of different folders different directories on the hard disk you can do the same thing at the command line tree is the command that you use to do it another command that you've probably seen me using a lot already is ls ls just stands for list out all the files and if i want to i can do long and short format so right now i'm doing a short format where it's just giving me the names if i want to do long format i do a dash l and now i get long format so we're going to cover what these first bunch of characters mean over here and at later on today but just scrolling over these are permissions this this block here this is the owner followed by the group owner. Uh, the size, directories usually tend to be 4096. They're always 4096. The date that the file was created or modified, and then the name of the file or the directory. So long listing gives you extra, extra information. Short listing just gives you, you know, the basic stuff, right? Just a, just a very short listing. If I wanted to change my directory and go into something like documents, I can cd documents. And now remember, I created a folder in here called private. So if I run an ls from in here, I can see that I have private. If I run my tree command again, I only see private because I'm at that level where I don't get to see the other things that I have. Well, let's do something interesting. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use a shortcut here, dot dot. That goes back one level. Okay, and so now I'm back to the, the home directory. 
if I type in TW, TWB, PWD, which just stands for Present Working Directory, um, it shows me exactly where I'm at. So let's see if we can go up here to home and let us go. So if I type in tree now, now I get a little bit of a different view. I can see my home directory, my user directory called Ted, and then the things that I have inside of it. So kind of cool. I'm learning how to navigate through my system. If I need to get into my home directory, it's just CD Ted, or another shortcut you can use is CD and then the tilde character. The tilde character is short for home and whatever your username is. So even if I was in temp, which is a long ways away from home, right? It has a bunch of temporary stuff in here that it's using. We're not gonna get into what any of that is. If I need to quickly get to my home directory, instead of typing in home, Ted, and all that stuff, right? That's like a dozen characters. I'm a really lazy person. I can just go CD tilde and bam back to my home directory. So two really common shortcuts there with the CD command, CD dot dot, which takes you to up one directory level, and then CD tilde character, which just means home username, whatever your username is. All right, so going to the next slide, shell navigation. Uh, we started exploring tree a little bit, and we saw that there were a ton of different folders out there. If I go to the root folder of this operating system, if I look at PWD, it says I'm at root. I'm not in any directory right now. I'm at the start of the file system. Um, but there are a lot of different files in here, right? That's just gonna keep scrolling around. That's gonna, that's gonna go for a while. Um, get rid of all the flashing text. But if I type in ls here, I can see that there's a ton of directories. I'm going to do a long directory listing. Um, so we got boot. This is where the bootloader is. Right? Remember, we talked about the bootloader earlier. We have the Etsy directory. This is used to hold configuration data, including passwords, group information, things like that. Um, we have bin and S bin, where where bin go? Here's bin, bin and user bin. This is where most programs for the system reside. Okay, so these are system programs. Um, we have S bin and user S bin. These are for super user programs, so also known as the root user. Um, the user file system. This is where a variety of programs and tools to support user interaction with the operating system reside. Okay, so user, remember earlier I went into user share docs. Okay, so those documents are meant to help me. Uh, so they're in, they're in the user directory. User local is sometimes used, and we don't see this one, that one listed on here, but underneath user, there is a local directory. That's used for installing a lot of software locally. Var, this guy down here, what we call var, he is used for storing files that are going to change rapidly during the operation of the operating system. So those could be things like log files, um, any kind of files that the that the system is interacting with and is going to make a lot of changes to it. It's, it's the variable operating system. Um, this way I like to remember it. Home, we already kind of covered home. That's where users keep their, their data at. Um, we have a root user, that's the super user. The almighty root user. Um, he has his own home directory. It's not part of home because he is a special user, so he gets his own directory there. So our super user keeps his stuff. Temp is used to store temporary files. Um, and then we have some special uh, uh, folders here also. We have dev, which is where we keep devices. Everything in Linux is a file, even devices. So device files are kept in dev directory. If we do an ls on dev, we can see things like USB. We can see things like if this has it, bird IO ports. Okay, so there's a bunch of things under dev. We have uh, network devices, okay? Lots of cool stuff underneath dev. We have the proc operating system, which is a virtual directory. It doesn't actually exist. It's created when the file system is running. If you notice, it has the size of zero, okay? it's 
it's not really there. Um, but proc, it, it's, it's a virtual directory containing process information. So if I cd into, or let's just do an ls slash proc, um, yeah, let's just play all of them. There's a bunch of stuff in here. We have process IDs, which are these numbers, and then we have some of our um, devices that are running on our system. So ACPI, sound, command line, all kinds of stuff right there. Um, and then the last one is media and mount. Um, we have both of them. These are just places where you can mount external media storage devices, things like that. It could be, you know, some kind of network file system such as NFS, um, or it could be a USB drive. Um, but that's where you'd end up mounting those in the mount directory. Now, something that's a little weird is, you know, if you look, you'll see that we have these uh, files all over the place that have these arrows on them. What, what does that arrow mean? Well, it was, it's borrowed from, from the Unix world. Remember, Linux kind of has its roots in trying to mimic some of the things that, that Unix and Minix were doing. And what that's saying is that that's actually a copy of um, another file or another directory. So when you look on the screen, I'm sure that you saw bin is arrowed out to user bin, and lib has an arrow to user lib. So that means that bin is an issue there. Bin is actually in the user bin directory. And lib is an issue there. It's actually the user lib directory. It looks like it's there, right? And if I do a CD into bin, and it may not let me because I'm just a normal user. No, let me go. Cool. I do PWD, it says I'm in bin, right? But in all reality, I am in user bin. Um, but does it creates a direct, it creates a copy? And everything here is what we called um, symlinked. And you'll see that all over the operating system. Um, but it's symlinked to where the actual file is. Now, it's two different types of, of links in, in, in Linux. There's hard links and symbolic links. Hard links can only link to files. They can't link to directories on the same disk or volume. Okay, so if you have um, your file system kind of separated out to where home is its own volume and var is its home, home volume or lib is its own volume, um, you can't use hard links to link between those because they're all different volumes. Um, but with symbolic links, you can link files or directories. So hard you can't do directories, but symbolic you can. And they can be linked onto different volumes or disks. Those are created using the ln command ln short for link, um, but we're not going to do any of that today. I just want to get everybody kind of familiar with what those arrows meant in the file system. Uh, so the next thing we're going to talk about, manipulating files using wildcards. This is kind of cool um, because when you don't really know the whole file name, you can kind of sit there and, and guess, right? For example, we used that GNOME Desktop 3 earlier, and if I wanted to, I could do ls-l. We're going to do a long listing of user share doc, and we'll say, I know it's GNOME Desk. I'm not sure. I think it's GNOME Desk. And what that star means is match any characters, single or multiple, um, after uh, yeah, there we go. So after the star. So if I do that, I don't have the whole file name typed in. I know it's going to be GNOME Desktop 3, right? I, that's, but I can't remember the whole file name. So I'm going to use a wildcard. I'm going to say match any character. And when I type it, oh, I forgot my L here. Okay, when I list it, it's going to Go into that directory and show me the stuff underneath that directory because GNOME Desktop 3 was a directory. If I just do ls-l, it shows me just the files. And if I just do GNOME, I get a bunch of stuff. Right now, showing me all the different things that were match word GNOME because it's it's matching anything up to that point. But that last command I checked, I typed in actually after the dash. Okay.
Um, let's say I only want to match um, one character. Okay, I don't I don't know what version of the GNOME desktop I'm using. I don't know if it's GNOME one, two, or three anymore. So I'm just going to use a question mark. A question mark matches one character, whereas the the asterisk marks or matches all characters. So I'm going to be like, oh, there it is. Look at that. I found it. Um, so that's that's how that works. That's looking at GNOME Desktop 3. I'm going to copy over some of these files. Go back in my home folder. There we go. Into documents. And now I have some documents I can look at. All right. Um, and let's, I mean, and this is just a prep step here. So now when I look at this, I have two files, uh, one that has a bunch of numbers in it and one that has um, some lowercase letters. I'm going to CP news to All right. Um, so next type of character we can do, we, match we can do is the character match. And this will match any character that's a member of a set of characters. Uh, Linux has a lot of different um, what we call character sets or sets of characters. We have alphanumeric characters, we have alphabetic characters, digits, which is numerals, uppercase, lowercase. So an example of this is if I want to um, do an LS, okay, and, and I don't know what the file is, but I know it has like a digit, a number after it, instead of guessing or using you know two question marks or using uh, the asterisk i can actually type in something like ls read me dot one two and then we'll say you know i'm not really sure here but it should be a digit the last last one that's the way i saved my file and It didn't like that. I didn't like that. I'll ask back up. Digit. Oh, because I used a digit, right? Instead of looking for a number. Um, nice, that digit. That should be a numeral. Hmm. Oh, I had a dot. That's why. All right. So, sorry about that. All right, so if I do that, it does find readme123 because it matched that final three that matched as being a digit. Okay, so different ways that you can find files and, and stuff like that. Um, if you want to say, hey, it's it's anything but a lowercase letter, um, you can put a, an, an asterisk or an exclamation point in front. So going back to my old thing, with my last example, um, I'm going to say it is not an alphanumeric character or not an alpha that character, okay? And it will say, yeah, I can't find it. That's because I have the stupid dot there still. Um, there we go, one, two, three, because I'm saying since the last one is a three and I am looking for something that is not alpha, an alpha but A through Z kind of character, um, it is finding readme123. Okay, so that's kind of fun. We can you can explore that later on on your own. Very powerful stuff. Um, you see me some run some of these commands already manipulating files. So there's the cp command. The cp command copies things. So cp file one file two. So I already did like readme, and I can do you know like readme two if I want to, and I've made a copy of that file. And if I do my directory listing, I can see I've, I copy the file. It's actually the same size, 1,511 uh, bytes of data. So it's there. We're, we're good with that. Um, if I wanted to t copy things recursively, um, I can do that too. 
So I'm going to move some of my readme files. I'm going to move my news files into a different folder. So I'm going to go move anything that starts with a capital letter N, okay, to use my my the stuff I learned on previous screen with wildcards. I move all that into private. When I do that, and I do my ls, boom, gone. I don't see any of those news files anymore. So n star copied to everything that started with the letter n. So news went to private. If I do an ls on private, I can see my my two new my two news folders there. Um, going back to um, I'm going to go up one directory. Going back to the CP command. CP doesn't do things recursively by default. So we have to sometimes tell it, hey, I want you to do something um, recursively or create a directory if it doesn't exist. So I'm going to do CP R. I'm going to copy my documents folder to, we'll call it new docs. And boom, I'm done. I didn't have a new docs directory, right? But if I do an ls command now, I have a new docs directory. And when I go into new docs, I can see there's a copy of all my stuff. Now that's just a flat out copy. That's not linking like we talked about on the previous slide. That is just doing a copy. Now copy did something for us there. It actually, you know, copied the, um, it created a directory. Sometimes we don't need to, we don't want to run a copy command to create a directory. So what we can do is we can actually use make dir to create a directory. And so we'll call this um, fredlug. And make a directory called fredlug. Run ls, I can see fredlug is there. Um, I am currently inside of the new docs folder. Unless I'm like, oh, you know what? I really didn't need that new docs folder. I'm going to go ahead and get out of here, and I need to remove it. Well, I can do an rm. I'm going to go back to new docs here for a second. So if I do an rm just by itself, and I say, hey, I want to get rid of that lowercase readme2 file. I didn't type anything extra on this command, so it's just going to say, OK, I'm going to remove it. It's just a normal file anyways. Um, I can add some extra options and therefore, you know, tell me when I'm make, about to make a mistake. But if I wanted to do that same rm command on new docs, right, I can't remove new docs. It's a directory. So directories get a little bit more protection um, than regular files do. So if I want to, I could do rm dash r new docs. And what that dash r means is just recursive, okay? It couldn't delete the directory because there was stuff in it. Um, now that I'm going to use dash r, I'm going to tell it to be recursive. It's going to start at the bottom of the directory structure and just delete stuff all the way up through the directory until it gets the directory itself, and then it will be gone. Okay, so no more new docs folder. You want to be really, really careful whenever you use rm. When I was first getting started with Linux, I got really frustrated at what I was doing. And I was in this folder and things weren't working. And I was like, you know what? I'm just going to delete all the work I've done. And I did that. Actually, I think I did rm rf star. Rf just means recursively and forcibly. That deleted every configuration file I had. So don't do that. Always use RM with a lot of caution, okay? Don't do stupid things like I did. Um, so a couple more things on commands. I think that's the next one we're looking at. Um, much like we had the file command that would tell us um, what type of file it is, we also have a command called type that will tell us what kind of a command that we are going to type. There's a lot of different ways that commands run inside of Linux. There's four different types of commands. There's executable programs. Those commands that are built into the shell that are built into bash. There are shell functions, and then there's aliases. I'm not going to get into aliases today, but look it up. It's really cool. You can actually uh, create custom commands and have them aliased 
So when you type it in, they actually run something different. I'm not going to get into that today. But if I were to type in what type of command is type, it'll tell me that type is a shell built-in command. But what type of file or what type of command is ls? ls is actually ls to color equals auto. So that color equals auto is how I'm getting the, the blue and the white text or the blue and the gray text on my screen right now. Um, because the ls command, whenever I type it in, it actually runs it with that extra option of color equals auto. So kind of cool. Um, but again, we're not going to cover um, aliases very much. That'll be something for you guys to look at um, later today. Which brings us to the command which. Which is really cool because which will show us the location of a command. So for some reason, my path is all messed up and things just aren't running automatically, or I just want to know where the file is that I'm, that I'm running. I can type in which and then the command that I want to run or the command that I'm interested in. And it will tell me some information about ls. So which ls is currently telling me that ls, that alias ls equals, you know, the color equals auto, and that user bin is, or user bin ls is where the ls command runs from. So it only knows about files that are part of your path. We're not going to get into the path too much today, um, but which is kind of handy for showing you where things are actually residing on the Linux file system. And then we have the help command. Help is always very helpful. Um, there's a couple different ways of getting help. If you do ls-mcd, why don't, why don't I have that in there? Why not? Um, if I do, I don't know why I have the ls-mcd. Um, Anyways, if you type in either help or ls-h, that's not showing me anything either. Um, ignore the ls-mcd. I'm going to clean that up later. But most commands in Linux have a way of doing help. So, for example, ls-help shows me a help file. Um, cd-help shows me a help file for cd. A lot of times you can also just do cd dash question mark and that will show me some abbreviated help and valid option. Here's how you use it. Um, or I can do cd dash h. I don't know if that'll work either. Yep, abbreviated help. So <coughs> <coughs> different ways you can get help through a Linux system. But usually those help things, it's, it's just not enough data, right? Um, instead, what we're looking for is we're looking for some real, like, manuals, right? Some manual pages would be great. So we actually have a command in Linux called man, and uh, short for manual pages. And what it does is it provides, it gives you a way of displaying documentation for various commands. Uh, there's different sections of the man page and different types of information is held in those different sections. So the different sections are numbered one through nine. and um, they're listed here on the screen, but uh, the first section of man page is executable programs or shell commands. The second section is system calls, followed by library calls for section three. Section four is special files, usually found in the dev directory. Number five is file formats and versions, such as XE password. Uh, number six, all the manual pages for games, because you know, can't live without games. Great way of uh, spending time. Um, section seven is miscellaneous stuff, macro or macro packages, uh, such as man itself. <clears throat> Number nine, system administration commands, usually reserved for the commands that root has access to, the root super user. Section nine, kernel routines, that is not um, standard. We don't see a lot of man nine stuff. And then as we saw earlier when I was in that um, GNOME desktop three directory, there's a lot of um, text files that you can use with less or HTML files that you can use with browsers uh, to find your way around the Linux operating system and get some, some help for things. So if I wanted to learn more about the ls command, I could type in man, it should show me the manual page about ls. And here it goes, it shows me ls. Over the top of the screen, you see the parentheses with one inside of it. 
That tells me that it's an executable program. It's this is section one of the man file. And then it gives me a nice description, much better than that abbreviated help that we were just seeing. Right? So um goes my files, entries, how to use it. Here's here's how color works. Remember my LS command is alias to color, so this is showing me how how color works. Um, directories. All kinds of really neat information I can use with the ls command. And if I skip down, I'm now hitting page down to skip a little bit faster. Again, tons of tons of different ways of using the ls command. And if you find a way that works better for you than others, research how to use the alias command so that you can alias your ls and make it run the way you want it to. Um, but when we get down here to the bottom, um, we see things such as who wrote the main page. Um, where you can report bugs to copyright information, and then um, other documentation that you can get also um, for the ls command. I talked about core utilities early on as one of the important parts of the operating system. Um, as you can see, the full documentation is available at this URL or available locally via the info or utils ls invocation. So LS is part of that core utilities package uh, that we we're talking about earlier. But right. to get out of a man page, you just hit Q. That will get you out of the man page and return you back to the command prompt. So lots of documentation. Um, most of the certification exams that are out there for Linux do include the documentation in the exam environment. So if you can, if you, if you can't remember everything that there is to know about different commands when you're going and taking Linux certification tests at least know how to bring up the documentation for the different commands and maybe you can browse through there jolt your memory and figure out how to do things um, but man pages are very very useful things and okay, next thing we're going to get into this is, just kind of gets us to the jedi level of doing things on linux and this is how to redirect input and output now there's more there's more ways that you can redirect things you can redirect what they what we call standard error which is where error messages are logged to, we can redirect that to a different place. Um, but that's a little bit more advanced. So we're just going to talk about redirecting, redirecting standard output and input. And at the end of this um, course today, at the end of this talk today, um, you're going to see a pretty advanced example of redirection. Um, and and you'll, you'll, you'll probably get a better understanding of how this all works then. If not, you'll just be completely confused about redirection and and you'll probably never want to talk to any of the Fedlog people again. But um, redirection, really powerful. Like I said, gets you up to that Jedi level of doing Linux administration. So standard output. Standard output is always, uh, always defaults to the screen um, or the terminal inside of Linux. So if I do an ls command right now, I can see I just have a bunch of folders. I'm going to go back into my documents directory. Now I have some files. So if I do an ls and just hit enter, it just puts everything out on the command line, right? It, it defaults, the output is the screen. But what if I wanted to output that somewhere where I had it, where I could do stuff with it? Well, I might wanna put it into a file, right? So I can do an ls, I'm gonna use my redirection, which is my greater than arrow or the, the, the my, my elementary school teachers always told me it looked like an alligator's mouth. That was like 40 years ago. But um, you can you can just use ls. I always remember that I'm pointing at, hey, redirect this to, pointing to file list.txt. Boom, run the command. I don't see anything on the screen, right? Because it got redirected to a text to a text file. Now we talked earlier about the command less, so I'm going to use that here and just show you what happened. I now have another file in that directory called file list.txt. When I run less on the on that file, it shows me the listing of all the files that were in that directory. Okay, now that that wasn't super useful because I don't know if private's a folder or a file or a or a what, right? So. Um, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to run that command again, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to append the data to the end. And the way that I remember this one is I'm just going to do an ls-l this time, a long listing of the directory. And the way I remember append 
is two syllables, two arrows. I'm sure there's other ways of remembering it, but that's how I remember it. Okay, so I'm going to put in the same file I already created. Appending just puts additional information at the end of the file. It appends the file. Um, where if I just ran it with a single um, arrow right now, I would overwrite the file. I don't want to do that. I want to append this data to the end. So I'm going to use the two arrows, hit enter. I don't see any output because I'm redirecting the output to a file. And this time when I run less on my file list file. Here's the output of my first run. Here's the output of my second run where I did a longer listing. And um, so we can see that now I can see that private is a directory. And that's because of the D over here. We're going to talk more about permissions later on. Um, but I can I I now know what it is that was in my directory when I listed things out. So Q to leave LS and that is a way of um, redirecting output. Now, sometimes we want to redirect input. We want to um, do things with the data that we have in our files. So a new command that we haven't heard of yet is sort. And if I just um, run sort with some help, um, what this would tell me is that sort is a way of sorting files. So right sorted concatenation of all files to standard output. Okay, cool. Standard output is the screen. Well, that that this is going to come in handy. So I'm going to clear my screen here really quick. I'm going to type in sort. And what I'm going to do now is that arrow, I'm now pointing to the command, right? So I'm saying take stuff from file list.txt and run it as part of the command. And what it's going to do is just going to sort everything. So when I look at the way that it sorted things out, um, it's a little bit different now. It's not the way it looked in the file. If I'm just going to run cat here really quick uh, to cat out the file. This is the way the file is actually built. That's, that's the text in the file. But we can see what sort did is it put it in alphabetical order. It sorted it for us. So it starts with A, ends with T, it's got some special characters and stuff in the middle, but it's alphabetized. Kind of cool. Um, so what if I just wanted to? I'm gonna I'm gonna rerun my um, ls command so I can get rid of all the stuff with the special characters. Okay, so now my now my file. If I cat it out again, it's just the file listing. Um, but if I wanted to store that sorted data, right? If I run sort and I just um, do file list, now it's all alphabetical order, authors, file, private, readme, readme, readme. Um, what if I wanted to save it in that order? I could do a sort, get the, get the data I'm going to use in sort from file text, but then I can redirect the output instead of going to the screen to go to sorted files. Uh, oops, typo. Sorted files .txt. And when I check out sorted files, I can see everything is sorted the way it was on my on my output. So nothing was output to the screen. It was just all output to the file instead. Um, so kind of cool, kind of cool stuff. Um, how you can redirect input and output. Um, and remember. Two, two little uh, arrow lines greater than less than signs, alligator mouse if you want to go that way, like my elementary school teacher. Um, two of them is append, a single one is just redirect or overwrite. Okay, the next thing we're going to talk about for redirection is the ls command or the pipe command, pipelines. So what pipelines do is it allows you to feed the output of one command into another command. So we know that if I do an ls on slash, it's a really, or do an ls slash l on slash, it's a really long listing. If I do it on user, user share docs, it's even longer. It scrolls right off my screen. 
what if I really want to see what was at the top of that listing without it scrolling off the screen? I'm already down here in the X's. You know, by the time I can see stuff on the screen, it's in the X's. And, you know, I want to see what was closer to the beginning of the alphabet. So what I can do is I can do an ls-l for long listing, user share doc, that's where it keeps all my documentation. Um, and I can then pipe it. Pipe is usually right around the enter key, uh, one or two rows above it. And I can pipe that out to less. Less is cool because it allows me to scroll up and down. So when I type that out, notice my colors go away. That's okay. Um, but I can, I'm at the A's in the alphabet now. And if I scroll down, I can go down to B's, C's. I can hit page up, page down if I need to. And I can move up and down in this directory listing and look and see if something's there that I'm looking for. So kind of cool there. What if I only wanted to see the top part of a file, the first couple lines of it? We're going to use that um, We're going to use the um, same command. We're just going to add a T to the end of it, ls-t, and it was supposed to give me the head of that document, and it did. Um, so it sorted it, it sorted it by time. Um, and now it's showing me everything. It's not in alphabetical order anymore, but it's just showing me the first couple lines. Actually, no, because I didn't type that head. Okay, so now it's just showing me the, the 10 lines uh, that make up the beginning of that file, and it's sorted by time. So um, that's what that next command does, ls-lt, head. Head just shows you the first uh, 10 lines or so of a file. And then the other thing we can do is du. This is a command that is disk usage. So how much disk space are things taking? Dash H just means human readable. If I run that right now, um, matter of fact, I'm going to run it from my home directory. Du dash H. A lot of stuff. Um, any files that you see with a dot in front of them are hidden files. If you want to make a file hidden, just rename it, move it to um, have a dot in front of this name. Um, but there's a lot of files here that scrolled right off the screen. Um, some of them are bigger than others, right? So you have a file that's 1.5 megabytes. What if I want it to, I know I'm running out of hard drive space, so I want to sort something out. And I have, I have 19 megabytes worth of information in my home directory already. So what is taking up that space? All I've done is create some really simple text files. I shouldn't be taking up 19 megabytes. So let's see what I have, du-h. I'm gonna pipe it to the sort command that we just learned about and I'm going to um, add some extra options to sort, NR, which is just sort numerically. Still scrolling off the screen. Well, hey, let's do a less, right? We'll add less to the end of that, because we learned about that. And now I can see that it is just a bunch of little files, but I have some kind of LibreOffice 4 database um, from when I started LibreOffice before accidentally that is taking up almost a megabyte of space. Then I have some stuff taking up 700K um, documents, documents, documents is taking up 240K, the documents directory is taking up 212K. So there might be something in there worth looking at. Um, but as you use Linux more and more and you create a lot of files that have a lot of space associated with them, um, commands like du disk utilization dash h for human readable. Uh, if I leave that off, it, this looks a lot worse. Um, that's what it would look at look like. And so you'd have to do the the math and figure out how many megabytes or gigabytes or terabytes um, that number actually takes up. Um, so that's why I use the dash H to make it human readable. But as you as you do more stuff with Linux and you create more files, um, you will start needing to to sort things out and look and see what's taking up space on your file systems and maybe delete stuff if you need to. Some people have Big enough file systems where they never worry about it. So we talked about some filters already. Um, and so um, there's there's a lot more filters than that. Um, there's things like sort, which we've talked about. There's unique. Okay, so 
let's see how we can use this unique thing. I'm going to go back in documents. I think that's where I have my file list at. So I can cat out file list. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to do ls-l or ls again. I'm going to append it file list. Now when I cat out file list, I have duplicate entries, right? There, there's like two authors, there's two file list.txts, there's two privates, two readme's. And so what I can do is I can actually cat out file list, type it or filter it over to unique. And why didn't that work? Given that there's an input. So. And for some reason, it's not going to mean anything unique. But usually unique, and it's probably because I'm missing an option there. Unique would show you some some extra, some, it would show you one entry for each word instead of two. Um, rep examines each command line from standard input and um, allows you to match against characters. Um, we can do that really quick. We can rep um, me out of file list.txt. There's all the entries in the file list that have the word me in them. And if you notice, it didn't catch the ones with the lowercase me. It only captured the ones with the uppercase me. And that's because that's what I asked for. If I wanted to though, I could sit there and say dash I me. And now dash I just means in, in uh, case insensitive. And so I can capture both the uppercase and lowercase me's. So, um, Different things that you can do there. I'm going to try this unique one more time. No, anyways, don't mind. No, my unique isn't working for me today. Um, Sorry for us, Ted, but you may want to look, move on from filters or all your. Okay, yeah. So there's more there for you to to look at. Um, head. We we talked about head a little bit earlier. How head shows you the beginning of a file. Tail shows you the the end of it. So that's not the entire file, because if you notice, it starts with author, file list, text, private. And when I do tail, it starts with readme. So it's only showing the last few lines. Uh, translate characters is kind of cool. Uh, set an awk. Awk is, if you can master awk, kudos to you. Um, it's, it's extremely powerful. It's kind of its own programming language designed for constructing filters. Very powerful stuff. Um, then we have role expansion or expanding commands. Um, and this has to deal with a lot of um, ways that, that Linux handles different things on the command line. So if I want to type, if I want to create a bunch of directories, let's say, um, remember the special characters of two dots means go up a directory. And I can tell it, hey, let's go back down into pictures. Let's say I'm going to be uploading a bunch of pictures. I want them sorted um, for different months. I can do a make dir dash p dash p just means if if the if it doesn't exist, then just you know make it. And I'm going to call them like family photos, and it's going to be sorted by months. I'm going to go 2020 and then 01 dot dot 12. And what expansion does in the background for Linux is before the commands actually run, it looks at what these other characters are that are on the command line. And if it needs to, it'll run commands multiple times to create a bunch of different directories. So if I do ls on family, yeah, lf isn't found. Um, ls on family, I can see I have 12 different folders numbered from 0, 1 to 12 all starting with 2020 dash. So it ran, Maker actually ran uh, 12 times there to create 12 different directories. Actually, Ted, if you yep. take MK there uh, minus P and replace that with echo, you'll actually see it just expands the command line. It doesn't run it more than once. Oh, if I do this? Yeah. yeah. Minus P is okay, but as you can see, it's just basically expanding the command line. Yep. This is what is passed to mcurter, and it just loops through all those parameters. Now, it is very, very smart. If that becomes a very long list, it does what you say. It will re-execute the same command. Yep. So very cool stuff. Um, 
And then we get down here at the bottom of this page, we get down to single quotes and double quotes and back ticks. So um, ls-l, the back tick, which is Don't usually use a back ticks anymore. Thing. They're bad. Don't use them. Yes, they are bad. Um, don't use them, but if you do have to use them, use them sparingly. Um, so anything that you put inside these backward ticks executes. So if I'm going to do ls-l, which cp, the first thing it's going to do as part of the expansion is it's going to run the command between the back ticks, which is which cp, which would normally just give me the location of the cp command, right? So after it expands that out, it's going to basically give me a long listing of that CP command, give me all the permissions and things like that. So there it is. Um, so kind of cool, kind of combining a couple commands onto one line. Uh, but yes, they are dangerous. Use them sparingly or don't use them at all. Um, double quotes and single quotes are used differently in Linux. Um, so when you use um, double quotes, it output, it's, uh, double quotes prevents expansion from working except for dollar sign, which is variables, uh, backslashes, which we're going to talk about in a little bit, and um, the back tick character. Um, single quotes suppresses all expansion. Okay, so if I do an echo single quote dollar sign cal, you guys are going to like what cal, cal does. Um, I just get dollar sign cal. Pretty boring, right? If I use double quotes, remember it suppresses all that expansion, um, except it's still going to run this uh, function for cal. And what I get is I get a calendar. So that's pretty cool stuff, right? Um, so it shows me the, the calendar for the month, for the current month. Um, if when I use that backslash, you know, I mentioned that the backslash isn't suppressed either. Um, if I want to echo $5, and I just go like this, $5, I get echo.00 because it sees that dollar sign five as a potential variable. So what I have to do is I have to escape the dollar sign and tell it, hey, that dollar sign, not part of a variable. You do that with the backslash. When I do that, now I can get it to print $5. So expansion, very important to know, kind of ninja kind of skills at the Linux command line. More on the backslash, it can also be used to expand commands across multiple lines. So I can type in ls dash l uh, dash dash reverse dash dash human readable. And then um, I just want to use user share docs, right? Well, now the command is looking very confusing because it's going across multiple lines on the screen. So what I can do is when I'm getting close to going off the screen is I can use backslash, hit enter, and I can just keep typing my command, human readable. And sometimes doing this just makes it easier to read. And there we go. If I arrow up, it's put a sit all in one line. But if when I was typing it in to make it more readable, um, I can do it that way. Um, there's other special characters uh, that you can use. I'm just going to, for the sake of time, try copying some of these. Um, the well, maybe I can't copy any of them because they're on there. So um, one thing you can do, and we'll see if my microphone picks it up echo dash e my a dash a or yeah slash a uh, provides an alert and makes your terminal beep my computer beeped um, I'm escaping the double quotes too And I didn't hear my computer beep, but apparently it was supposed to have beeped. So <clears throat> my computer beeped is a way of doing it. Um, but there's there's other things you can do. If you need to enter a backslash in a 
in a in a uh, text file, you can use multiple backslashes to insert backslashes, um, form feeds, tabs, alerts, new lines, uh, lots of stuff that the backslash character can do. Um, now we're going to talk about permissions. So um, getting away from the command line for a little bit, um, we saw a bunch of times as I printed out different um, commands. You saw those characters at the beginning where it was dash rwx or some combination of that. Those are what are called modal permissions. And so I've color coded it here, used a bunch of arrows. Um, the set of three characters for this to the right, that is read, write, and execute permissions for all other users. Everything in, in Linux is owned by a user and potentially owned by a group. So, and then the third set is, is anybody else on the operating system. So if you want to keep yourself private, you know, keep some of your data private, you just make it to where you're the only owner, uh, that no, nobody in any group can own it, nobody in and the rest of the file subs can own it. And that's pretty decent for security. Uh, different types of Linux distributions have additional security things. Red Hat variants have SE Linux. Ubuntu variants have, have App Armor. I think SUSE has something too. Um, but permissions tend to cause people to slip up quite a bit. Um, so permissions are always expressed as binary bits. So if you remember how to do binary, you're, you're way ahead of the game in, in Linux. If you want something to just have read access, that's equal to the you know, regular number of 100, um, but in binary it equals four. You know? And so each of these three characters is another binary digit. Starting at the far right, we have a digit with a value of one. The middle digit has a value of two, and the leftmost digit has a value of four. So if you just want read, the value is four. <clears throat> if you want to be able to read and execute something, the value would be five because it's the uh, leftmost bit and the rightmost bit. And then read, write, execute is all three bits turned on. That has a value of seven because four plus two plus one equals seven. Um, and it allows you to write permissions manually. So if, if you want to change the permission on something, you can use a command and put in the numerical value. Most popular command for changing permissions is chmod. It's just change the modal permission. If I wanted to take um, and and change the modal permissions of authors so that nobody else on the system can read who the author is. I can just do mod. Now I'm gonna, I wanna keep the same stuff the same. So read, write, I know that has a value of four plus two, so six. Read is a four. I, I wanna get rid of this guy, so zero. And then the name of the file, authors. And I can see that my permissions have changed. It used to be rewrite for the owner of the file, which is me, Ted. Read for the group owners of the file. Anybody in the Ted group could read it. And then anybody else could also read it. Um, I've gotten rid of that. Nobody else can read it. Um, another way you can do that is by saying mod. And you can specify users, sorry, users and groups and others on this line. So I'm gonna add that ability to read back. So I can say others, add them, give them back the read permission on that author's file. And I wanna run ls-l. You can see that the read permission has returned for other users on the system. If I want to remove that again, it's just a matter of going o-r and it goes away. So different ways you can do that depends on, on what, which way you like the most. If I wanted to change the owner of a file, okay, I'm gonna change um, the owner. I don't have another user, so hopefully this will work. Shown root or file readme2. And I can't do it because I'm not, I'm not root. Um, but if I was root, I would be able to change um, the ownership of the file. Uh, same thing with group. There's no other groups on the system I have access to except for my own group. But chgrp, change group, 
is how you would change the group permissions for that file. And everybody in, you, in Linux, when users are created, they get a matching group with the same name they do. You can create extra groups. We're not going to go into that today, but you can create more groups, and then you can add users. So if you actually have like an authors, a group of authors at work, you can create an authors group, add all the users into a group, give permission for the authors group to the authors file, and they would all be able to um, manipulate the file through their group permissions. So um, any questions on permissions? Awesome. All right, so job control. We're getting near the end of, of the day. Job control is very important in Linux. If you have processes running, um, you can see those processes using the PS command. Um, if you need to kill a process, if you need that process to go away to end because it's locking up your system or it's just not responding anymore, you can usually kill it with the kill command and get rid of that process. Um, you can list jobs. You can put things in the background, foreground. Uh, there's a lot of different things that you can do. When you run the kill command, sometimes you specify the level that you want the kill command to run at. And um, it really just comes out to different ways of killing a process. Uh, there's four that are that are commonly used. The first one is kill one, and that would just be the same as closing a window. Um, however, if your window is hung and it's not responding to clicking on the X, chances are kill one is not going to do anything. Uh, kill two is kind of like pressing control C. So if you have a program that's running in a, in a, in a text window and you know control C inside the window isn't doing anything, you could try control C outside of that environment and see if you can kill that process. Um, 15 is usually termination signal, just means, hey, it's time to end and goes away nicely. And then nine just means I don't care what you're doing, you're going away. I don't want to deal with you anymore. And that's that's the most rude way of interrupting and killing a process. When you kill a process, the most important thing you're going to need is the program ID. So you can see right now, um, when I hit the PS command, it shows me that I had a process ID for writing the PS command. But since I'm in a bash shell, I'm in my terminal environment, I actually have a process ID for writing the terminal environment called bash. So let's look at an example of job control. Um, yeah, so we'll go back into the um, we'll go back into our desktop environment for this. And I'm going to have to do a yum install excise really quick. Yum is the uh, is the Red Hat package manager. We talked about package management being part of the operating system. Uh, two most popular ones right now are um, yum for for like Red Hat type of systems, and then apt apt for um, usually the Debian's and the Ubuntu. Uh, type of systems that are out there. So from here, I'm going to, first I'm going to make my window a little bit smaller so I can see my instructions. Um, i make this a little bit easier so that everybody can follow along. I don't need that anymore. Okay, so I'm going to run XIs and Ampersand. That just means that really. All right, so now I have these cool eyes, right? They're kind of, this is kind of a fun thing, right? They, they follow me around on the screen. You know, where my mouse goes, they go. Kind of fun. Um, so when I look at it, I ran the, the ampersand. Ampersand just means that, like to return control to me after the command runs or gets running. So if I type in jobs right now, you can see that I have, I'm going to make text bigger for everybody. Um, if I run jobs, you can see where 
it says that I have a running process for excise. Okay, it doesn't give me the process ID or anything. It just tells me that excise is running. So if I run PS, I can get the process ID, 4510. So if I type in kill, I'm just going to kill it nicely. It's just going to default to a normal little kill. I'm not going to get violent with it and do dash nine or anything. Uh, kill 4510, process goes away. If I tip in jobs, I no longer have an excise job. So it's very easy to control jobs in Linux. You just have to get used to a couple commands, uh, mainly jobs, PS, and kill, and that'll be a good place to start for controlling jobs. Uh, one of the things that you probably see me do a couple times now today is becoming the super user, uh, becoming using SU and getting elevated privileges um, on my system so that I can do things. There's two different ways that are mainly used for doing that. Um, I didn't set it up on the system, so I'm going to open up a terminal window to my um, work laptop and just show you guys there. <clears throat> so let me close this again because I don't need it. All right, so um, two different ways of becoming root. When I type in SU, which is just super user, this is going to prompt me for a password. If I type in my password, it's going to set the first second and then tell me I'm wrong. Um, so if you want to go directly to the super user account, you have to know the super user's password and then it will let you in. And that's not my super user password either. Uh, well, that's cool. Um, so it's it's a security feature, right? It's not letting me in either. I'm probably fat fingering something. But for in the interest of time, we'll keep pressing ahead. They re, nobody really, not too many people use SU all by itself anymore. Um, instead, they're using sudo, which is um, just a lot more powerful. So if I do, as my normal user, if I do ls-l and I go to a file that I shouldn't have access to, such as the audit log, where it audits all of the security features of the system. When you can see my tab complete isn't finishing anymore because I don't have access there. But if I type in, hey, let's get a listing on the security log file, it tells me I don't have permission. That's because I'm in as an unprivileged user. I'm just my normal work account, T. Brunel. If I really want to do that, read it though, I could do an L or a sudo, ls-l, and then var log audit. Still won't let me do tab completion but I know it's auto.log. Now, if you notice, it says, what is your password, T. Brunel? Now, I'm in a special group. With sudo, you have to you have to be in the sudoers group for this stuff to work. Um, so on my work laptop, I'm in my privileged user group. In, in Red Hat derivatives, it's called wheel. Other operating systems might use a different group name. Um, but I'm going to type in my normal password and it lets me look at the at the file right if you notice the owner of that file is root and only root has read and write capabilities to that file nobody has anything as a group user nobody has anything as any other user on the system so i sudo allowed me to run a command as root and immediately turn me back to my terminal prompt as an unprivileged user um, again, you have to be in a special group to be able to get those special privileges to be able to run root level commands. Um, but it's important for people to under it's important for people to understand um, how to do that. Now, well, if you notice, it it returned me right back to my user account. Right, um, I was root just long enough to run a command. If I wanted to be root for a longer period of time. So that I have to know root's password through the su command, which obviously I don't know um, anymore. I must have changed it or something. Um, but what I can do is I can do sudo dash i. And that just means interactive. Boom. I already put in root's password a little bit ago when I ran that sudo command. Um, it hasn't timed out yet. So I can type sudo dash i, and now I'm root. I can actually type in this ls command without putting sudo in front of it. 
and I can be root for as long as I want to. When I'm done being root, I can do an exit and back to my user account. You don't want to run as root a lot of when you're using Linux day to day. Run as a non-privileged user. With with a non-privileged user, if I were to run that RF that RM command that I talked about earlier that wiped out all my configuration data, if I was a non-privileged user, it probably wouldn't have worked that well. But I was probably root at the time, which allowed it to wipe everything out. So always use sudo kind of sparingly. Use it when you need to, and you know use that to get in, to get root level access <clears throat> instead of just using the root shell all the time. The, using root shell all the time is is kind of dangerous. Um, I don't recommend it. I don't think Peter would recommend it either. Um, but we do see a lot of people who do that. So just a bit of caution there. The next thing we want to talk about as we're getting close to finishing here is um, some useful network commands. I'm going to continue using my work laptop because they just work better here. Um, but if I wanted to get my IP address for the system, I can type in IP and it shows me a bunch of extra information. If I type in A and L, it just says IP address uh, for everything. I can see I have a system, a, a network thing here called NP, ENP0S31F6. Um, I have a couple of virtual interfaces. I have a loopback interface. But this is my current IP address for my laptop. And the IP address is right down here. So if the screen was bigger, um, you'd be able to see those a little bit better. Um, oh, four minutes of command. There we go. So it numbers the interfaces, one, two, three, four, five. And then you can read through the, each block of text. Like this is the entire block for things about the Wi-Fi interface. Um, we know that's a Wi-Fi interface because it begins with a W. Um, Ethernet interfaces begin with an E. Um, so other things we can do with the IP command is if I want to set a link up or down, I can do IP link set, and I can choose up or down uh, based on the interface. Um, a lot of systems are beginning to do this more and more, where you hit tab and you get command options. So if this is my physical network interface, my Ethernet interface. If I wanted to, I could tell that to go down. And operation not permit it because I'm not root. So we'll run sudo, right? Because again, non privileged user can't change things on the system, can't do things that are dangerous. But if I run sudo, I can do that. So now my interface is down. <coughs> Excuse me. Another uh, useful network command is NMCLI. A lot of Linux systems now are using the network manager uh, system for managing network interfaces. NMCLI is a command line component for that. When I was in the GNOME desktop earlier and I was showing you guys the network settings, that's all Network Manager as well. So with Network Manager, I can do things like connection, show, show me all the connections on my system. And I travel a lot, so I have a lot of airline lounges, airports, hotels, and um, it just goes on and on. I, you know, probably too much. Um, so there's there's a lot of lot of stuff there that you can see. Um, I can see device status. So it shows me what's currently connected. So right now I have my Wi-Fi connection, a virtual bridge for my um, Ethernet interface. Um, P2P Wi-Fi is disconnected. That's probably a good thing. Um, virtual networks, tunneling networks. Um, a lot of things I'm doing with my Linux system, bumping mail like normal usage. If I want to see something cool, though, if I want to do something cool, instead of just getting device status, I can, because I have a Wi-Fi type of device, I'm going to look at my Wi-Fi device. So NMCLI device Wi-Fi. And what it's going to show me after a couple seconds is how strong of a Wi-Fi signal I have based on different Wi-Fi networks I have access to. So Zephyr is, is again, I have a Fios connection. I have a, a speaker that has a Wi-Fi access point. And uh, Zephyr is the network inside of my house. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a multi point Wi-Fi network. Um, so I can see that I can get a pretty strong signal off of some of my Zephyr devices 
uh, not so strong off of other Zephyr devices. That's cool because it's supposed to be covering the whole house anyways. Um, so when you're in an airport or something in a hotel or in a conference room, you're like, man, I need to get on a better Wi-Fi uh, connection. You can run this NMCLI device Wi-Fi and it will show you the strength of all the different Wi-Fi signals in the room. Kind of cool to know. And then if you ever need to query where some website is address-wise or you just want to make sure that DNS is working properly, NS Lookup is a good way of doing that. Google.com gives me all the cool googly answers, including IPv6 and IPv4 addresses down here. There's IPv6. Next one up is IPv4. Um, really handy to figure out if your DNS server is working better. Um, some people prefer a command called dig. I find that for beginners, NS Lookup's um, output is just easier to understand. So that's why I put it in here instead of dig. If you want to see how your computer is routing traffic to make sure that you're not having some kind of weird internet provider outage, you can use Traceroute. And what it does is it sends packets out and it queries devices as the, as the packets hit them to figure out how you're getting from where you're at to where these servers are that we just saw in NS Lookup. So going this route, you can see that I hit something called test Wi-Fi here. Yep. That's in my house. Um, then I go out through a router. I go to Culpeper, Virginia, through Verizon. So over to where, close to where Peter lives. Then I head up to, and you can tell this stuff because you know they're getting really creative with with it. They name these access points. So IAD is probably Northern Virginia, somewhere near the Dulles Airport, because that's the Dulles Airport identifier. Um, and then we get a couple IP addresses, and I end up hitting the Google website and about eight milliseconds. So pretty quick, um, not worried about that. And then the last one that I wanna show as far as network commands is netstat. And I'm gonna pipe this out to less um, just because it's a little bit easier to see that way. But when netstat runs, um, it shows you all of these things that you're connected to. So um, this is showing me all of my established internet connections. Um, can't really figure out what any of those are, but hey, it's all good. And then um, if you're troubleshooting something like a web server, um, being able to see what you're listening to is also handy. So you can do things like netstat, and there's a bunch of different commands in netstat, but basically this one says TCP, UDP, listening on different devices, and this is showing me what kind of traffic my system is listening for, what ports are open on my, on my system right now. Well, 631 is a printer port. Um, I'm using a BlueJeans app. There's a BlueJeans helper uh, thing that's running right now to help out the BlueJeans app and, and so on. Um, where 53 is open because I run a DNS server. Um, so all kinds of cool, interesting things you can get with NetStat to help troubleshoot and then there's also for, um, in case you're wondering, hey, who's logged in my system and what are they doing? We got the W command. And W will show you anybody who's logged into your system and what they're currently doing. So I can see I am logged into my system and I am currently doing something with Firefox, the Firefox web browser, which is ironically the browser I'm using for the slide presentation right now. So got some useful commands. Uh, then this last page here, uh, before we get into kind of a fun thing that's optional if people want to do it, I know we're a little bit over time already, is um, just some more interesting commands. So um, disk free tells me how much space is available in my file system. df-h, remember dash h, but du was human readable. Same thing with df, uh, shows you human readable. The find command, if you are ever looking for a file and Typing in which is not working to figure out where that file is, um, you can use the find command. So find, the, the syntax word is find, the starting point of the file system where you want to start looking. So I'm looking in home TED. The type of thing you're looking for, type F, means you're looking for a file. You can go type D, and that'd be looking for a directory. Dash name is the name of the file that you're looking for. And then a lot of people at the end will put in dash print which tells it to only print out positive results. Otherwise, you get a long streaming mess of text all over your screen. 
Um, if you ever ran a command in the past and you're like, man, I wish I could remember what that command is, like how did I run make there before to create 12 different directories all at once? Um, you can and remember grep is also used for looking for things. You can type in grep makter and it will show you. In fact, I'll just do that here. I can type in history. It shows me all the commands I ran. If I do a grep makter, it'll show me the commands that are makter. So here's one where we created 12 different directories all at once. And if I wanted to, this is kind of cool. If I want to run that command, I can just do a exclamation mark, 131, because that's the history number that it gave that. And history, I think it holds 10,000 commands or something like that. Um, 131, boom. If I look here now, I have a directory called family, and inside of family, I have 12 different folders. So I was able to rerun that command just by going exclamation mark and the number that was next to it within my history file 131 so there you go unpublished it little tip reverse is kind of fun if you ever want to spell something backwards you can type in rev red lug is meeting and i think i have to have it in quotes maybe so anyway, oh, ref has to be received during standard input. Here we go, rev. And there we go. Red lug is meaning spelled backwards, says that. In the team, C Uldurf. So kind of cool, it reverses text for you. Um, top will show you the top running processes on your system, and it also show you some system utilization info. Uh, kind of cool for troubleshooting systems. If you ever want to create a file, but you don't want to actually put anything into the file, you can just do touch this dot file. I misspelled it, but that's okay. And there's my file. Notice it's zero bytes. It is an empty file, but it exists on the file system. Uh, last one is stat. Um, so if I do stat, this file um, it shows me some kind of cool information about that uh, probably useful for troubleshooting uh, file this uh, file it shows me the file size on my blocks I'm using um, which I know the file is stored at um, my access permissions both in uh, numerical and modal format the UID of the user and the GID of the owner uh, shows me SE Linux security contacts we didn't get into SE Linux that's another talk for another day uh, shows me when the file was born or when it was created, uh, when it was last accessed, modified, and changed. So kind of cool information there. But what we want to do at the end of the exercise today, as Peter and I were talking about this and trying to put it together, is we wanted a way for everybody to kind of explore their Linux system a little bit, if, especially if they're new to Linux, and have it do something kind of fun, right? So we decided to go with a web server. I only tried these instructions once, so I'm, I'm sure that they work, but they, they may not. Um, but what these do, based on whether you're using a Fedora, CentOS, Red Hat type of system, or using Ubuntu, MIT, Debian kind of system, um, you'll just wanna copy these commands, run them. So the first thing you do is use the package manager that we talked about early in the conversation to install some packages and make some necessary directories on your system. Then what we're gonna do, and everything is run with the sudo command, uh, then what we're gonna do is we're gonna run the cat command, which just catenates the file out. We're gonna use some redirection. So we're gonna redirect, and, and the, double, the double redirection um, back to standard input just means until a condition is met. So it's going to redirect until it sees something called EOF, EOF is typed on the, on the keyboard, and it's going to create a file called var www.html, index.html, in both sets of directions. You can just copy and paste this um, or type it on your screen. Um, you should have access to the, to the uh, slide deck, so you can just copy and paste it right out of the slide deck. And um, 
in fact, the whole block from sudo all the way down to EOS. Just copy, paste it. Once that command completes properly, service Apache 2 reload if you're on Ubuntu, sudo system CTL restart HTTPD if you're on Red Hat or Fedora, and then go to your browser, open up 127.001. That's a very special address. That's the machine's home address. It never changes. Every machine responds on that address, not over the network. It's non. You can't get to anything from outside that address. It's, just, it's got what we call the local host address. Um, and it's only accessible on the local host. So open a browser, you can try that. Um, if you have any problems, contact Fredlock during the mailing list or over the mailing list and Peter and I or somebody else will try to step in and help you get your uh, cool little web page up and running. What it's meant to do is to show you that with the information that we presented today, that you are able to do something beyond just playing around on the command line, um, that you're able to put these types of things together and do something much cooler. So that is all I have. I'm gonna stop presenting. And uh, yeah, we'll see who else is still left here. 10 people still left. No, Peter, okay. I'm done. I'm answering a few questions or as you've been talking. Um, but please, anyone on here, please speak up. And uh, if you wanna ask the same questions you asked in chat or to Ted, go ahead or ask other ones. Did I say thank you. Did you guys record it? Yes, we're recording still. Um, yep. uh, once we have it done, um, I will try to figure out where to put the recording. I could upload it to YouTube uh, and put it there. Um, it, I'm not so, yeah, keeping it on the Red Hat server may not allow outside Red Hat, you know, people without Red Hat address to access it. So. Yeah. I want to see if I can find a good place to put it so everyone can easily get to it, including um, the presentation that Ted used today. Yeah, make sure there's video no command is. Yeah. So the media versus mount usage, no real difference there. Um, you can use them. However you want. Media is kind of the, the like Peter said, media is for fuse mounts. So if you plug in a USB drive into a system now, it actually will try to auto mount it under the media directory. Um, mount is more legacy, but a lot of times people will to take network devices under mount and then removable devices under media. Um, but, 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 um, it looks like that was already covered too. Cool. Um, yes, I was using slightly outdated Fedora. Didn't have time to download the new one. And I don't see much else. Anything uh, that we covered that you want to see some more details about, and like you know, more detail than in solar or other features? All good stuff, thanks. I still awesome. see a lot of older admins tell me not to use Network Manager and to remove it on servers. They actually tell me to uninstall it. Is that user space security mentality or is it just old habits they don't trust it or you were older yeah i would um, say old habits old habits die hard exactly <laughs> <laughs> you know a lot of people also say disable se linux and yep. yes in the beginning of the se linux days that was advisable now we advise you not to disable se linux in the beginning of the network manager days it was advisable to disable network manager because of the way that network interfaces were started and that other services maybe couldn't interface with those with the systems that network manager was managing quite the same way um in rel 8 and later versions of fedora and ubuntu and things like that is not so much an issue you can usually use it running there's a less and less cases now where you want to turn it off i say since rel 7 uh which is 
five, six years ago, it's been pretty stable. When Rail, when Network Manager came out in the middle of Rail 6, it, it, yeah, it wasn't pretty. And most people kept the old way of doing it in Rail 6 because of that. So in Rail 7, though, can users actually ma manipulate Network Manager at all? Or they don't have access at all on a server? Say a VPS server, not a desktop. Depending on how you set up your devices and your connections, right? So if you're setting up a system device as an admin, the users cannot change that. Uh, they can see it's there, sort of like they can do with the IP command, but they yeah. can't do anything. But if you set up a user device, they can. And that's part of uh, why you saw Ted doing it. He went in and looked at the network settings. And as a user, he can connect to a Wi-Fi network because it's a user device. But if I, want to be, Sorry. if I want to be the overarching admin, I could mark that device as a as a non-user device. And I can sit there and say, you are only allowed to connect to one network. And you know, if you take your laptop home, you can't connect to anything. Sorry. Um, you, you, we, we can do that. We can have that kind of control. It's, it's not needed. Um, and network manager, like in the past, if you had to set up a VPN, um, nearly impossible to do with Network Manager. I actually have a system at my house that connects to um, Red Hat over a VPN from the command line using Network Manager. So it has gotten 100 times better than it has. Uh, there's only limited cases now where you have to disable it. And a lot of those are around some software-defined network cases. I guess, yes, uh, can you hear me? Yes, yep. we can. Yeah, so I guess I have like a question around that where I see uh, like part of like the uh, centralization towards uh, system D, we also have uh, network D, which I'm not entirely sure what the use case around that is versus network manager. So network D uh, is sort of a competing or an alternative idea to instead of system D. Uh, so when call asks, before it was part of Red Hat or did uh, Alpine and all that, that was what they were using to control the network. It's the same idea as Network Manager, meaning you have a daemon that has all the system privileges and then you have an API in front of it where you can start dodging out who has access to who can do what and why with the devices we have. You don't have to have access to root files to do, uh, to do all your network stuff. You can delegate some out to non-privileged users. So you avoid using sudo's and all. Uh, which one? One, I think system D sort of a, a network manager, or at least for my the four or five uh, distributions that I see more often, they all basically switch to that. That, But network D, I know, is, is still around in some places, and it, it just serves the same purpose. One of those many cool things that are just, if you don't like one solution, there's usually another one out there. But and I mean, I, I mean, I guess, uh, like, I mean, of course, like, network manager is just more common because, you know, we have network, nice little indicator applets on our desktop environments. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And so, to, when I looked at network manager, that was one of the leading reasons we it, it really came around was if anyone tried to use, if you remember how Linux was uh, 10, 15 years ago, I mean, you couldn't even put a CD in a drive without being root. Right? You could not put a USB in without needing root access to set up a new device. That was also the case for networking for a long, long time. Any minor change, even if you wanted to Wi-Fi, required root access. Network managers, one of its purposes was to break that and allow user space access to, what, as we said earlier, to devices that we considered user controllable. Uh, and, and network, Wi-Fi network is one of those that is very typical to user control, right? Or um, you may, you know, plug your laptop into a, a physical network, but you want to, as an end user, be able to change the IP address. If it's not a user device, you cannot do that. Um, when I put in a USB, it happens automatically, and it is actually using root privileges to do that initially, and to set up that initial device, and then provide it to me. It changes the privileges, so it's my ownership on on the devices once they have been created by root. Um, 
but without that feature, I couldn't put a, a USB in my box and use it without, you know, escalating my privileges. So it, it solved an important problem, but like everything else, when we start out, things are kind of hairy. <laughs> uh, and we, for a long, long time, we did both. We had uh, the files, the old way of doing it, and we had the new way, and you sort of had the choice. And I think a lot of us, and I know this for myself, uh, once I've learned something, it's very hard to unlearn it again. <laughs> and, yes. Yeah. And I knew all the, the nitty gritty parameters that I could do on the file side. So it was easier. In the early days, it was absolutely easy to set up a box the old, with using the, the old proven way of doing it. it. Takes a while to learn new tricks. That said, now when I set up an interface and setting up firewall relationships, or it will automatically go up and down depending on whether the device is present in the box. Setting up a bunding or the VPN that Ted was talking about earlier is so much easier than it was with the files. I mean, if you've ever done a bunded device using old fashioned bond or, or the new team without Network Manager, you think you're going to kind of run screaming back once you figure out how easy it is with Network Manager. Definitely, definitely. That said, the files are still there. If you do a man on an on MCLI, you will find where those files are eventually. Um, but you will probably not see exactly what you expect to find. So it is a little bit of a warning that because Network Manager deals with multiple profiles and the locations that you remember did not know about profiles. <laughs> What you think is the current value today uh, may be all written because the profile changed. Like, for instance, uh, I go to an airport and I connect and I'm no longer home. It's a different profile that gets allocated. But it's the same file because it's the same device. So you, it's, it's something that is very hard to do manually. So you either use fully network manager or you take fully manual control, but then you can't change it as a user. Right. Underneath the cover, it's still a Linux kernel. I, I, the, IV, the IP command that um, Ted was showing can also configure network interfaces. If you have rural access, you can say, here's the IP address, you know, set up the route, so the gateway, set up all of this stuff, and it will do it. But you need root privilege to do that. And that's what network manager uses behind the scene uh, on the daemon side. The privilege side of it. Yep, you can do all kinds of uh, really crazy stuff with Network Manager now. It's quite easy to set up bonded interfaces, teamed interfaces, VPN interfaces, um, Wi-Fi. It's gotten a lot better. You know, it used to be that, you know, except for the most rudimentary kind of network configuration, you would you would disable Network Manager and then use the, the old network um, service. To get everything configured. That's since changed. And, um, you know, we still have people saying that configuring network interfaces is one of the most challenging aspects of Linux. So one of the things that we've been working on um, is, you know, through the use of things like Ansible that we've um, presented before at this, at this group, is to include some basic Ansible scripts within each distribution um, that when you run it, it'll just ask you a couple questions and then configure the network interfaces based on how you responded to the questions. So, you know, things are constantly getting easier and constantly becoming less complicated, you know, like the big simplification of IT. Um, because people people want things to be easy. They don't want to, like, you know, work all day, come home, and then have to battle with their laptop to get on a network. That's not fun. You know, people throw their laptops out the window and go back to their cell phones. When you saw a test installation, where did he configure network? It still worked on the network, but he didn't configure it. Yeah. Right. So in most cases, we have made it so you don't even have to care about it. I mean, B meaning community. Uh, yeah. uh, for a long, long time, at least in Fedora, uh, when you boot it up, it just worked. 
I remember when that was not the case. <laughs> and you had to configure uh, devices and you might even have to put in special kernel parameters to make sure they were actually optimal and, and the link signals were correct. All that stuff is now automated. Yeah. I suppose nowadays it's just having the right Wi-Fi card. It, not as much as it used to be, uh, but yes, you can absolutely pick hardware that is not supported by Linux, but I can also do that with pretty much any other platform if you just really vanilla yeah. grab something. Uh, and sometimes it's because the, wife, the the hardware you buy, well, it was cheap for a reason, <laughs> and I've been there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so it didn't, you know, it's bucks or whatever, and you have to figure out a way of updating it or something before it works. Definitely. Yes. Uh, I mean, so I must admit, I have the laptop I use today is probably the least happy I've ever been with a laptop from Red Hat. But I've used Lenovo uh, for more than 10 years now, and and I'm not unhappy with the Lenovo's uh, way of, you know, setting up the hardware for Wi-Fi because it still works. It has all issues, and that's just one of the things I look at from a hardware vendor is I want to be sure that when I turn it on. I don't have that kind of issue. Is is it supported or not? I I saw the uh, I think it was the uh, Fedora ThinkPad initiative that they started. They announced this week. I did. Yeah. I almost pasted the link. Uh, let me paste it now since you mentioned. Yeah. It. Um, so yes, um, Lenovo and Red Hat. Well, so Red Hat's official laptop for a long, long time was nothing, nothing but Lenovo, and now we have a lot of our people who bailed out and use the Apples instead, and I. I'm still not sure why that is, but anyway, uh, if you're using Linux, it's, Le it's Lenovo. Uh, yep. Or basically, if you get a real laptop uh, from uh, IT, uh, that's what's running it. And it has been freaking rock star solid for many, many years. Um, and uh, I think we finally convinced them that since we can make it so easy, so can they. <laughs> <laughs> um, and even better to me, just putting Fedora on it and, and not making this rail or something, you know, with a big red hat on it, uh, I think is also very helpful. The, the easier it becomes to consume hardware, the better. Um, I like, you know, that an, anyone can just buy a laptop, turn it on, and they're, they're, they're up and running in two minutes. They don't need to know how it works underneath the covers. Uh, personally, the people I have taught uh, in, in, in my family, or actually I haven't taught them Linux, I have installed Linux, and they basically <laughs> turned on, and they will go browse, they will check their email, doesn't matter, they don't care. Yeah, the GUI is pretty simple to use, actually, you know, it's, um, and some people, they, they refuse to even sit there and try Linux, so like, no, it's too hard. It used to be too hard. Now with all the GUIs that we have and stuff, you know, it's the same as same difficulty level, maybe even a little bit less. But moving from Windows to Mac, it's probably less difficult to move from Windows to Linux. Um, at least if, if you're just going to stay in the GUI and be a regular desktop type user. That's it. I'm lost on a Windows desktop these days. I mean, even that's on that desktop. I mean, I can do the basic ones, but that's it. Beyond that, I get lost. So I guess that's the opposite way when a, a Windows person sees Linux for the first time. But I've been doing Linux so long that I, ca I can't remember those. You know, thankfully, I've also been seeing you know video game performance getting a lot better, uh, from my end at least. Oh yeah, we've been doing yeah. that gaming on Linux talk as part of Fredlog for years, and it's it gets better every time. Yeah, definitely. The quality of the games and the Steam performance. Steam has done, of the games. Uh, I think, I think in Wine opened up the, the door for a lot of older code, but Steam has really opened it up for newer games. Yeah. Not everything works, but holy moly, have they allowed you to basically take almost any Windows game today and just run it. Yeah. That's phenomenal. Um, Our, the only single point of failure that makes this like, I'm not optimal, it's just the anti-cheat software. Well, because then it will it will just trip. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, if you start- Otherwise the games will run great. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. 
Yeah, well, yeah, a lot of that stuff is very platform specific. So yeah, that's, uh, you know, gotta remember it's emulating some Windows features in order to make the game work on, on, right. on Linux. Because for some reason or another, and one day I hope someone can explain it to me, uh, a lot of game vendors, they only want to focus on one platform. And that's it. It doesn't really matter what else is around. Or, I mean, even Apple doesn't get a lot of games on their platform. And the game vendors just look at one place, and that's it. We have even had some, oh shoot, who was it? That has started doing ga games in Linux natively. And they now uh, announced they were dropping that and going back to just Windows. I wonder if it's just because they don't hire Linux people and they don't understand how the platform works. Well, it's also because uh, I know what company you're talking about, and it was also because they got uh, bought out by a bigger company that had a different set of priorities. Um, and that's usually, that's pretty much how it went there. It's it's sad because I already paid for the game expecting, you know, support yeah. Yeah. at that point. Well, and that's an odd disadvantage on the uh, the Steam side is a, a lot of the things you're buying there is temporary because it's based on a online service that has to stick around for the game to be alive 10 years from now. It probably wouldn't be. Um, right. And Steam sort of hides that because it makes it so freaking easy to, to, to do anything that is online based. And you don't necessarily notice it until it's too late. Right. And I've had, yeah, I've seen things where even where you save your game or your state is in the cloud. And then all of a sudden the cloud changes and you lose everything. Hooray! <laughs> um, but anyway, back to this. Um, any other questions uh, in specific to what Ted did or maybe related to what he said or I'm looking at the time we are half an hour over right now. Going once. Going twice. Okay. So yeah. cool. Absolutely. We will figure out what we do next month. <clears throat> um, my guess is we'll probably have to do a remote next time. I'm not sure when we open up whether they're going to allow big groups to get together. <laughs> yeah. They may actually all require us to have the long distance and all that, and it may be simpler to just sit up and out one of these. Yep. Yep. I think we should plan on doing virtual again next week. Does anybody have any feedback on the on the system that was used? Good, bad, other? Because we have another one that we can use too, or two more. I've got yeah, we've got quite a few options here. Yeah, was there a bit good with uh, with blue jeans? Quality was good. Audio quality, video quality. I'm okay, but yeah, looks pretty good. good. Happy. Cool. Couple of delays, but now. Very good. I'll get the recording here. Let me stop the cool. recording and. Um...